one of my favourite books uh, was Ida Cruz uh, and Anthony King's book on the SDP, and they compared the SDP to somebody who had shown much promise but died too young. Uh, and in, a, in, a, in some respects, UKIP uh, invites a comparison to the SDP, because even though the ideology and policy platform is obviously completely different, we, we are having this debate about you know, how far can this party go within British politics? Can it last beyond uh, May, May the 7th? Um, well, let's take a look at some of the data. Uh, most of the data I'm drawing on is from the British election study. So it's a very high quality, uh, very reliable source of information. And what's interesting about UKIP is that over the past, over the past year, just over a year, its support in, in the BES has remained um, pretty steady, as it has done really in the opinion polls. We've had a bit of a debate recently about UKIP support being squeezed. The reason we've had that debate is because people are looking at the opinion polling in the autumn at the time of the parliamentary by-election in Plankton and Rochester and Shrew, and are then seeing a decline of around four to five points and are concluding that therefore UKIP is being squeezed. Indeed it is from the autumn, but if you look for example at where the party was at the beginning of 2014 as to where it is now, actually supporting <coughs> UKIP is broadly uh, stable. How did UKIP supporters vote previously? This again is something that we're um, uh, debating, especially after David Cameron pleaded um, to you to support us to come home. Um, if we look at uh, who you get voters said they had supported in 2010, it is certainly true that most of them voted for the Conservative Party, okay, but still, cast your eyes down the axis there, you can still see that actually this is not near the 70 80% that some <coughs> would have you believe. Um, if we go back to 2005, the picture is more mixed. Around one quarter of UKIP supporters said that they voted for Labour. And this picture has been added both by uh, myself and Rob Ford, but also by Jeff Evans and John Mellon at the University of Oxford, who have gone back even further. And basically, the picture you see in the UKIP space is of a, an electorate that is more fluid than we often think. Uh, lots of voters who perhaps supported Labour in 97, perhaps held on to Labour in 2001, then either went into apathy or perhaps went to Cameron and the Conservatives in 2010 and have now broken for UKIP. So I would really urge you against this, by into this notion that these are diehard tribal Tories who are abandoning uh, conservatism. The picture is more complex. How firm uh, is support for UKIP going into this uh, short campaign? <coughs> well, the charts um, that the senior pack is showing you the percentage of UKIP supporters who say they are highly certain to vote. And this is from the latest um, way for the British election study. Now, to give, so to give you some numbers, 70% of UKIP voters say that they are uh, certain to vote that way. That compares to 76% for the uh, Conservative Party, 78% for Labour. The SNP, uh, building off on uh, Rob's points here, they are the most loyal, 88% say so they are certain to vote that way. Big problems um, for Labour, obviously. But one point I do want to get across is, you know, this idea that, that UKIP is simply a flash in the pan protest party, you know, they may have troubles on May the 7th, but their voters, their core voters, are actually quite loyal to, to the party, more so than we, we often um, thing. Some will defect um, and are defecting. Peter Keller and others have written about this. Um, where will they go if they do leave UKIP? Um, what's interesting is the British election study allows us to look at the second preference votes for supporters. Imagine that you, know, you weren't voting for your chosen party, who would you vote for? Um, what's interesting here is that just under one quarter of UKIP supporters, 23%, say they have no second preference, okay? But the, most of them, uh, at least the largest number of them, uh, say the Conservatives are their second preference. But even still, that figure is only around 50%. So when David Cameron says come home, only around one in two of uh, UKIP's voters uh, say they would consider the Conservative Party to be their second home, if you like, beyond UKIP. Um, but, <coughs> Before you say, well, that solves David Cameron's problems, uh, does it? Uh, something we've done here is, well, let's ask the question, could the return of those uncertain UKIP voters uh, to the Conservatives uh, solve all of their problems on May the 7th and allow the party to win 
um, the national uh, share of the vote. Or if we reallocate those UKIP voters who are not certain, UKIP would go down to 7%. This was the assumption that we all had last summer that um, UKIP would crash and burn into the single digits as they had done after 2004 and 2009. But actually, if we just reallocate them based on their second preference votes, and this is a key point, um, UKIP defectors would not be enough um, uh, for the Conservatives to close the gap uh, on Labour, who would remain two points um, clear, at least in terms of vote share. This is quite a crude measure, but I think it gets at this debate that we're all having. Of course, this does not take into account seats, okay? But there, there is um, no way um, uh, in my view, that, 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 that firstly, this UK electorate will break on mass for the Conservatives, but secondly, even if those who said they would do that <coughs> did, um, the picture would not necessarily be one where the Conservatives are suddenly enjoying uh, rays of sunshine. Um, what are the problems now facing UK? Um, what are we likely to see on May the 7th? If you're watching the Lord Ashcroft polls closely, if I know some of you are, one of the things you would have picked up on firstly is that UKIP support outside of its top targets is dropping. Okay, so outside of Fagot South and places like uh, Thurrock and Boston Skegness, if you look at the Lord Ashcroft polls, for example, those that came out this morning, UKIP support is typically down to somewhere between 8% and 20%. Okay? Um, now, What's interesting, if you take the polls this morning, for example, is that even in seats like Dutton South, where UKIP has been working quite hard, it is down to 20% um, from previous polls. It's still above its national um, share, but it's not seeing the kind of pressure on the main parties that it was hoping to see. Whereas in other seats, for example, Campbell and Red Roof in the Southwest, once upon a time UKIP were quite um, optimistic about the prospects there, it's not really in the game. Those conservative voters, and, and, and other voters have stayed quite tribal. And this reflects a broader problem that we can see in the chart. <coughs> this is showing you the percentage of voters who have been contacted by um, each of the parties since the beginning of 2014. And you can see when UKIP caused that so-called earthquake in British politics at the time of the European elections, the contact rate for UKIP eclipsed that for the Democrats, but still stayed behind the left Conservatives and Labour. What's happened since then, however, even during the autumn by-elections and that peak in UKIP's polling and where we are um, today in terms of the most recent wave of the BES, UKIP is now lagging behind even the Liberal Democrats in terms of its overall contact rates. Now, this is not giving us a picture of what's happening in the top targets. So this is not telling us, you know, how many voters are hearing from Nigel Farage, how many voters are hearing from Douglas Carswell, but at a national picture, uh, at a national level, sorry, it suggests that UKIP does have a problem in terms of its overall contact rates um, with voters. Something to consider as we look at some of the top seats um, uh, to watch on May the 7th. And, you know, a couple of things that are interesting um, and something will be on my radar um, as, as I start to come in. First is, is what Colin and Mike have said. There are some fascinating overlaps between the seats that you can target in uh, and the local elections on, on, on May the 7th. You are likely to see, for example, in places like Fanit, UKIP um, would be UKIP voters, perhaps supporting UKIP locally, but voting Conservative or another party nationally. This could be a real problem in some seats um, for UKIP. Um, the second um, thing to watch um, are the number of second places for UKIP candidates. You know, the old um, sayings that second place is nothing in British politics. Well, in some respects, the Liberal Democrats would say second place is everything because that's how you build a, a proper insurgency. And if you look at the north of England in particular, how many second places will you could get in Labour seats? How many second places will you could get in some Conservative held seats? That's something to watch. The SDP in 1983, 300 second places, for example, um, but arguably failed to build on those. Um, the seats to watch on the board, basically what we've done here is we've looked at, um, we've taken a lot of census information together, political data, I won't bore you with how we've done it, but we can talk about it in the Q&A if you like, and just identified some of the top seats for UK, uh, Clacton, the most uh, friendly seat for UK in the country, I expect up as Carswell to poll uh, at least 60% of the vote, if not higher in that seat. Uh, Boston and Skegness, Great Grimsby and Lincolnshire, Great Yarmouth, Cannock Chase, lovely. 
the Dudley seats where I've said uh, that they're facing some uh, trouble. Planet South, which is the 41st most favorable seat for UK, uh, based on the local demography, uh, based on the fact that the political conditions, Laura Sanders has stepped down, there's no incumbency advantage for the Conservatives. Uh, Thurrock, where UK uh, uh, was last night at the public meeting, and some seats like Rotherham and Castle Point. I think we'll be talking about these seats on May 7th. Rochester and Strood, which is not on the list, um, I think will be more uh, difficult for UKIP than, than it was last autumn. But all of the attention is going to focus on Fan itself. And just to finish, you know, a couple of observations about Fan. Um, you know, and this is sort of based on what I've seen on the ground and also what, what we know from some of the polling in Kent. Firstly, the Labour vote in Fan South is not as strong as some people are claiming, in my view. So I think the election outcome for Farage will be decided um, in many respects by what happens to the Labour voters and the non-voters. In some parts of that constituency, in Sandwich and Broadstairs, you have a very tribal Conservative vote. Can you get beat into that Conservative vote while also winning over Labour voters and non-voters? That's the big dilemma for Farage, because there is a risk that the Conservative voters will stay tribal and he won't heal off enough of the Labour voters to carry him over the line, which in a way is why Will Scobie, the very energetic Labour candidate and the surrounding networks that he has, really makes a difference, because if Scobie holds up that Labour vote, Nigel Farage has some real problems in the South. The other thing to keep in mind is that because this is now a classic three-way marginal, Know, we've had six constituency polls in Planet South, all of which, except one, have painted a very close race. Everything will come down to the get out the vote operation on election day. Now, what's significant about that is that the person running UKIP to get out the vote operation was the same person who ran the get out the vote operation in Rochester and Chew in Clacton, which would suggest that Farage has something of an advantage, perhaps, over, say, the Labour get out the vote operation, where, you know, if we were being honest, I don't think we'll scope the interest support as perhaps he should be from the Labour Central Party. In much of the same way that the Labour candidate in Rochester and Strew didn't receive the amount of support that perhaps she should have done, and had she, then perhaps my reference would not have won the seat. So these are some interesting dynamics that we're going to see play out from May the 7th, so I think it's really going to come down to that ground game, who can mobilise their vote better, what's going to happen to those Labour voters, but more generally, you know, what's going to happen in terms of UKIP seeing consensus among like academics at the LSE forecasting conference two weeks ago was that UKIP would take 11, between 10 and 11 percent of the national vote and somewhere between one and five constituencies. I said six weeks ago at the time, I was thinking they would probably take six. Now, much more conservative in my estimate, having seen some of the polling coming out from Will Ashcroft, I think somewhere between two and three, possibly four constituencies. Be a good day for you, kid. Um, but we, 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 we will uh, we can take that into discussion. Excellent. Thank you.